Brian. Thank you, uh, and thanks for taking the time, Dr. Mayo. I was wondering, since we all, I guess, to some degree, seem to be in this period of transition, if you could talk a little bit about, um, there's obviously been a lot of work done, partnerships built, um, maybe data systems created. Where Can you talk a little bit about where you see, uh, where you can build on that, if, if and at whatever time we actually put COVID in the rear view mirror? Um, what you see the possibilities are going forward from what's been done? Oh, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Great question. And I'll, I'll first of all just start by addressing all of you and say it's uh, nice to see you all again and thanks for taking time today. It's I always appreciate our dialogues and opportunity to um, to provide the, me the media and the public with information. So <clears throat> to your question, uh, I, it is true that the pandemic has really been a, um, a stimulus for improving um, communication and partnership across our community between Rochester Regional Health, U University of Rochester, um, the county leadership, the city leadership, and those have all been great things and they've been able to accomplish some really important work. Provided that the pandemic will be settling into an endemic phase so that we are no longer burdened by these huge waves that, that really um, consume our entire attention. Um, I think that there's some key and important priorities that we can continue to work on as a community for the future. Um, I think certainly partnering together on addressing some of our um, healthcare inequities, it would be an important community priority. Um, I'm not the community leader to, to really be the one that calls out, uh, you know, which priorities will be um, identified and, and uh, built upon, but that certainly is one that we could work on together. Um, I think there's continuing opportunities for us to um, look at um, education across the community to be sure that our communities are being educated for just general preventive care. And um, there's a lot of talk about burnout across the country as well as in our community. That's a public health matter that could also be um, addressed through some collaborative and shared uh, you know, work partnerships. So I think there's plenty of things for us to really work on, you know, big things that have existed before the pandemic. Um, that have been um, highlighted during the pandemic and that will no doubt be important things for us to address in the future. Thank you. And I was just wondering here for the maybe the short term, what has what is your greatest concern, either either in the types of COVID cases you have coming in or just um, some of the residual effects you're starting to see show up, be it, I know there was a report about maternal health, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about mental health. What, outside of COVID itself, what of the, some of those ramifications uh, are top on your list? Yes, there has been a lot of uh, discussion about these sequelae, these long-term sequelae, not just the, the long COVID symptoms that any given patient might have, but these community symptoms. And um, I do hope that, that, um, that people who have felt isolated, who have felt um, just um, you know, stressed by the inability to feel community connections will be able to come, come forward and re-engage. And then our community as a whole will be able to re-engage in um, all the great things that happen here whether they're um, you know, festivals or gatherings or celebrations or you know, support groups, theater. You know, there's just so many things that have been on hold now for quite some time that we have to reacclimate ourselves to these things and not forget that um, sharing talents and sharing um, just time with each other is really is a very important human function and, and that we ought to be getting busy re, re um, connecting with all of that. Thank you. Um, Jennifer? Good morning. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Okay. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I'm wondering if you could just sort of give us an update of what it's like inside the hospitals right now. I mean, obviously, we're not seeing the overwhelming number of COVID patients, but have you started reintroducing elective surgeries? And, you know, how much of a backlog is there with those? And, and sort of what is the, the feel among employees about is it time to breathe or are we still really short staffed kind of just what's what's it like right now oh yeah sure yeah that's a great overview the um well so i'll just start with some just data and then work into the um that larger picture so you know from a COVID standpoint our finger lakes the rochester regional health finger lakes hospitals have 50 active COVID patients in our hospitals only one is on a ventilator right now so that's just a tremendous reduction. Um, but but we have, I say, I say 50 active COVID patients. Those are the ones that remain in isolation because of their active symptoms. But we still have about 80 other patients who came in with COVID who are no longer active COVID, but who are still sick and recovering. So, you know, some of those folks, because of the sequelae of their severe illness, will take some more days in the hospital before they're ready for discharge. So, so that gives you a sense there. Um, but our hospitals are quite full because there are obviously other illnesses that um, we have to continue to care for. And, our, um, and so we are very pleased that we are now starting to ramp up our elective surgeries again. Um, that process, the planning process for that began at the beginning of last week. And so now those schedules are starting to roll forward. And so patients should be um, should be hearing from offices that have been waiting. And there is a backlog. I, I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. It's a lot of people um, that have been waiting for either um, you know, endoscopic procedures. Some of them are follow-up of known diseases. Others of these procedures are for you know, routine screening type um, purposes. And so we're anxious to care for these patients and to be sure that they have what they need and, and they've been patient with the whole situation. So yes, we want to, we are in the process of ramping up and that will, that will take us a few weeks and then probably a few months to catch up. So um, that's, that's a big body of work. Um, and, and we still do suffer from um, some, uh, you know, understaffing. And I think everyone knows in the community that our healthcare employees have just done an incredible job. They've stepped forward with immense um, commitment and uh, personal sacrifice to meet the needs of this community. Um, some of our employees have chosen to um, look for other positions. Some just chose uh, that because that it was the right time for them in their life and, and what they could handle. And then um, others um, were, um, were um, unable to continue because of the vaccine mandates that came down from the from the state, and th there weren't in pr proportionally a lot of patients or a lot of excuse me a lot of employees that fell under that category. But th but there were some, and we we want every wonderful employee we can have, and so we we are still working through understaffing. We anticipate it'll take some time to you know refill those positions and train people and so forth. So. Um, that's part of part of our um, calculus in managing our um, our day to day workload. Um, our emergency departments um, still, from time to time, have a lot of overcapacity. Today, as it is, as it may be, our uh, emergency room overcapacity is quite low. It's quite low, and so it's very good that we have very little overcapacity in our Unity and Rochester General emergency departments. But that does fluctuate from day to day. And so that remains a major concern to be sure that patients aren't waiting undue periods of time. And, and we know that that does happen. And so we need to support patients during those critical acute um, encounters. And then my follow up is in regards to the staffing, like you were talking about. I know um, the University of Rochester has said about 25 to 30 percent of the positions they have are open and available and they're recruiting for. Is that a similar number? And are you seeing a lot of loss to of nurses to agencies? And how do you deal with that? 
<clears throat> yes. So um, I I don't know in right at the top of my head the exact percentage, but we are some of our units are um, 25, 30 percent vacancies, and then others uh, we are more. Um, and then we backfill with either redeployed individuals or we backfill as much as we can with agency. Um, agency costs have really been a huge premium over the last year and a half. And so the cost of hiring premium staff has gone up um, uh, considerably and they have um, hired away some of our staff. And so um, that's been uh, um, a challenge for us. And we respond to that by, you know, by doing what we can. We, we have higher, we have increased many of our pay uh, based pay rates. Uh, we want to remain competitive. We want to pay our employees fairly. We, we are committed to that. We have always been committed to that. Um, and then uh, we've also on top of base pay rates have offered numerous incentives for people beyond overtime, you know, just as an expression of our gratitude for them stepping forward to care for patients in difficult times. So we do things like that. And then we hope that the relationships that we have with our employees um, keep them with us. You know, we, we wanna have positive relationships and we try to work through any, um, you know, discrepancies that come up in human relationships. So that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Will? Okay, now I'm unmuted. Sorry, I was having a little trouble with my mouse. Um, anyway, good morning. Um, uh, the a uh, couple weeks ago when I spoke with the U of R, they they had mentioned on a couple of occasions that they'd started a unit uh, to have sort of virtual uh, skilled nursing care in hospital as a way to cope with the constant uh, backlog of patients who could be discharged, but uh, to skilled nursing uh, or rehab that can't be. Um, is that how much of an issue is that with Rochester Regional and how are you coping with that? They, they had planned at the time I first spoke with them to cut, shut the unit down within a few weeks. They hoped the situation would be alleviated. It has not been as far as I know to date. Yes, well, that is called an ALC unit or an alternate level of care. And so those are patients who no longer need the, uh, um, the intent, more intensive acute care provided in a hospital, but don't have a place to leave. They're, they're not well enough to go home, and, but they're not sick enough to be in, in a hospital. And so then you say, well, are they, do they go to a long-term care facility? Do they go to a rehab facility, independent living, or home with home care services? and family supports. And so those are those um, uh, decisions are all made on a very specific level based on that patient and his or her family and what they can and can't do um, at home or, um, or related to their medical complexity. So yes, we, we have um, cohorted patients um, that are of that um, nature for some time as well. And, um, but they're also um, throughout our hospital and, and they have been, we've always had patients like this in the hospital um, well before the pandemic. And what we do is we, we try to maximize the therapies that they need to get home. So if they were a patient that would otherwise have gone to a rehab facility, we try to maximize their inpatient rehab to just jump from a longer hospital stay to home. Um, or we um, work on strengthening swallowing so they don't need a feeding tube and can start to eat. You know, So those are the th things we do. Um, we'll continue to do that. We, we continue to work with our long-term care partners and our home care partners to find new solutions for individual patients as well as for the broader um, needs of that group of patients. So, it's, it's very meticulous work and it, it's a major focus for us uh, at this time. Uh, yeah, well, that, that speaks to, uh, I think this is still part of the first question, but that speaks to, you know, uh, 
uh, bed shortages, which became critical in uh, the pandemic, but it's a, a, a long-term problem for this area going back to 2001 when Genesee Hospital closed uh, and uh, hospitals here have, uh, many of them, especially the ones in the city have typically been uh, 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 more than 100% occupancy much of the time. Uh, do you see that continuing to be a problem as the pand pandemic becomes endemic? Um, it is a complex problem. You are absolutely right. And there are a lot of factors that play into this. Um, there, this community is um, fortunate in that there are still many uh, long-term care rooms available in facilities, but they aren't fully staffed or they are not fully equipped so I, I do think that there are um, some important questions that we as a community need to ask and um, answer about how we want to um, resource the continuum of care, the whole continuum from hospitals to long-term care to, you know, to um, independent living to, to home care. And we need to uh, work with the state. And I know these discussions have already started um, and we heard some of that already in uh, President Biden's uh, State of the Union address about long-term care and how do we as a nation address um, needs in long-term care and how do we as a, as a community do that? So I think that some of the answers are uh, found in policies um, that relate to uh, the regulatory environment and the requirements of, of that. Uh, part of the answer is in the reimbursement environment for, for this entire continuum. And part of it is just how we as uh, clinical teams partner with families and partner with each other across institutions and find solutions and just, just create meaningful solutions. So it's going to be um, uh, a lot of work and that needs to, and it needs to get done. I agree. We can't be um, having our community members um, just sort of stuck in between these decisions and not getting the optimal care in, in the optimal place that they need. Okay, and uh, for my second question, could you, uh, could you elaborate on what you see as, uh, I know you referred to this also in the interview you had with PBS a few weeks ago, the, the systemic uh, problems uh, that, that, that need to be addressed. Uh, you spoke of inequities, did you mean are there other systemic problems that you think need to be addressed? And could you be a little more specific about it? Well, I think every complex system has systemic problems, you know, <laughs> and despite all of the uh, good things, and I don't want the good things to be overshadowed, um, but, um, oh gosh, that's part of uh, oh, my job every day and lots of people's jobs at Rochester Regional every day and in every health system to um, to try to solve these things and um, so so things let me just uh, be more uh, more specific at, at your request um, you know we have a very powerful tool in the electronic health medical record we've spent uh, well it's it's actually in the hundreds of millions of dollars build you know installing it and refining it over the last decade. Uh, we continue to build that system. We continue to use that system to help us take better care of patients. Um, and so the electronic medical record is part of the solution and is also sometimes part of the problem, right? Part of the challenge. And so um, uh, because if the, if the system isn't designed just right for some unique circumstance, it's, um, it creates some laborious actions to get things um, customized. Um, so, so that's one thing. I do think that, um, that there are at times um, incentives, financial incentives that aren't, that aren't always aligned, right? Um, each institution um, works to ensure that it's, um, that it's a viable institution to provide the care that it needs and to pay its employees properly. And sometimes those incentives are at odds with other institutions. And a, a simple example of that is um, hospital, uh, some of these ALC level of care patients and long-term care facilities. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, 
the, um, for, for example, some medications are very expensive and the hospitals bear that burden. And sometimes long-term care facilities can't afford them. And so they'll deny the patient based on the cost of a medication. So how can we partner and solve that problem together? Um, so those are sort of some of the, uh, gives you an idea of some systemic problems that, that get in the way of doing what is best from the patient's perspective. So are and the so, solutions, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I, so I do think greater alignment of, of the, of the incentives of the organizations to what the needs of the patient are is something that we have to get better at. We've been working at that, but the pandemic has really shown a greater light on that and, and we needed to do better. Just a quick follow. Would, would the, uh, so I, I would get the impression from what you just said that the solutions to those problems would largely be legislative and regulatory. Do you agree? Um, I, no, I don't think it's just law. No, I think it's there. It, there's enough for, um, opportunity to go around. Um, so yes, there are legislative and financial um, s- solutions, but there are also process solutions. There are, um, um, you know, just uh, there's so many things. There's, you know, even just how equipment is handled and ordered and implemented, and it, there's just many layers of. Of, of knitting together these complex systems to be sure that they are efficient and that patients move through the, the system of care as efficiently and productively as possible. Okay, I'll stop hogging the time. <laughs> Raquel? Hi, <laughs> Dr. Hi, Mayo, Raquel. nice to see you again. Um, you know, I always go when all the good questions are taken, but um, you know, it seems like everyone um, all the officials, county officials, healthcare officials, they've been in better spirits, right? Um, how is it like in this hospital? Is it safe to say like the culture is like the pandemic is behind us now and everyone is, how is how is the spirit now in the hospital? How's everyone doing the staff? Um, can we say that the pandemic has has is behind us and now we're in better spirits? Yeah, thank you, Raquel. Um, you know, as humans, our, um, our emotions and our temperaments are, are so important in how we get through each day. And um, I think the pandemic did really um, zap a lot of people of their, of their uh, uh, otherwise optimism and enthusiasm in life. But um, I do think that people feel relieved. There was a great sigh of relief when the governor stayed the booster mandate. Um, and it was a relief, not so much about um, just the booster, but just about uh, recognition of independent decision making. And even though um, medical science and and um, you know I encourage and our health system encourages everyone to be boosted, um, there it felt like at that point we were sort of crossing a line of of um, of the value of mandates um, smothering too much local or independent decision-making. And there's no easy answer on how to strike that balance. So I do think that that did give us a, quite a sigh of relief. Um, I'm, I'm not, no, I don't think that everyone ha- is sighing the, re- the sigh of relief that the pandemic is over. We're, we're, we all kind of want to, and we're all really close, but not quite yet. And, um, but, uh, but, uh, I, I do think that people feel more relieved. Certainly the reduction in the number of severely critically ill patients has been a big relief. And so people in our ICUs you know, feel like they are able to manage patients at a pace that they are more accustomed to and it makes sense for high quality care. So that's all very good news. And, um, but people are still um, now eagerly looking forward to closing the gaps on some of the staffing challenges I've mentioned earlier. I think that's probably the next biggest hurdle for us to really get through before we all feel like we kind of made it through all this and now we're back to usual as it was a few years ago. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Also, um, as far as like bed capacity, um, would it be safe to tell the general public like, yes, we we do have beds available, um, don't fret, you know, you will get a bed space if you do decide to come to emergency room. What is the bed capacity like? Yes, um, there, yes, there is capacity. The general public should know that they 
they, they can come to the emergency rooms and, and receive the care that they need and be admitted if needed. Um, this still does fluctuate day to day. So, um, for, uh, so, so patients may still have uh, wait times. So I don't want the public to believe that you know, all waiting is over. That, that is not the case. Um, but it is much less than it was even a few weeks ago. So, um, so we hope that that will be a continuing trend. Jane? Yeah, Hi, thanks for um, taking the time. I have a question about the trend in hospitalizations. I know you said the ICU is looking really good um, in terms of those patients that are critically ill with COVID, but for those who are recovering, how would you describe the trend over the past month or so? Are we heading in a better direction um, for COVID patients in general? Um, well, you know, there's always this, um, uh, gosh, how do I, how do I describe this? You know, there, as, as the pandemic is evolving, the, the, the sort of the, the front of the pandemic is different than the middle and the back of the pandemic or of a wave, right? And so we're coming out of this wave now, we've come out of the Omicron wave so the so we're seeing less um, admissions, less positive patients. We did see a reduction in the severity of illness, a significant reduction in severity with uh, with the Omicron wave, and that reduction in severity was evolving through that wave. So um, it seems that with each succeeding week and month, the severity of illness with COVID is getting less and less, and I think that has to do with the fact that there's enough native immunity as well as immunization induced immunity in the community. And so um, I'm hoping that, that, that we'll, we'll continue to observe that in the coming weeks and months. Um, but there's still uh, a lot of patients who are in the hospital, somewhere on the order of 60 to 70 in our hospitals that have recovered from the COVID virus, but not from the COVID illness. They're still debilitated, they still have you know, their lungs are still healing. Um, some of them, um, you know, acquire a lot of swelling and the swelling is not bad. Like, so there's just a lot of healing. And so those folks, are, uh, to them, it doesn't seem any better. Uh, I, can, I can certainly vouch for that. But, but day by day, our total numbers are shrinking. And so people are, um, you know, recovering. But uh, I think for the new cases, we are seeing them uh, moving more and more along a milder trajectory than in the past. Thank you. And I think uh, just to double check on the elective surgeries, um, is it all like elective surgeries, like same day procedures, 23 hour procedures, those are all resuming this week? We, they are all resuming. Um, I can't promise all this week. Uh, we have a, um, a sequence of, of steps that we're taking to ramp it back up. And so they are all ramping up and um, the surgeons are looking at their caseloads to see how to prioritize and, and triage patients in a, a logical and needed sequence. And, but yes, all those categories, same day um, surgeries, um, ambulatory surgeries, all of those categories of surgeries are being uh, turn back on. Great, thank you. Thank you. Isabel, you there now? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hi, Hi sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome to Rochester. Yes, things that we're really working on um, are, are uh, areas around what we call throughput. 
and discharge planning. How do we partner better with uh, long-term care facilities? How do we get patients what they, um, how do we predict what they will need better? So when the time for discharge comes that we are ready, ready sooner to get them out of the hospital. So uh, that's a big area of focus right now. Um, and then we're also looking at um, the whole um, management of patients that are um, in need of uh, what we call complex care, right? So uh, because many of these severely ill COVID patients um, have many, um, have a multitude of complex medical problems, like they, they, they will need special care when they leave the hospital. And so that also shifts some of the priorities, not only for um, home care, but also for um, uh, the other levels of intermediate care, whether it's um, you know long-term care, rehab, or other stages of that care. So all of those areas are really being evaluated. How can we do them better, not only for the current patients, but in the future? Oh yeah, so um, I think that what you're asking me about is when a person checks into the emergency department, are they waiting before they're triaged? And, um, and the triage process is an assessment of their acuity of illness and what do they need right in that moment or in the subsequent time that they're there. So the triage process has been reinforced. So, so, so we do, um, um, strive to ensure that patients do not wait long for triage, right? So that, so we've actually moved physicians, more physicians into the triage environment to facilitate that triage process. So um, I can't speak to all the emergency room specifics um, uh, without one of my emergency room colleagues here, but um, I can reassure you that the triage process is um, very carefully scrutinized day by day to be sure that patients aren't waiting for that part of their emergency room care. Thank you. Um, so that's the done with. Is there any like emergent question that anyone has? We have about five minutes. Um, any follow up? If not, um, I, mean, I can't help myself. I know. That's why I left <laughs> it open. I left it open. I knew it. There you go. Jump, jump on in. You touched on this briefly. I'm wondering if you could. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Uh oh, you can't hear me. You can. Yes, hear me. I can. Okay. Um, you touched on this briefly. Um, the vaccine mandate. Uh, we had heard that you had the potential to lose hundreds of nurses had that not been stayed. Did you guys reach your office and say, "Hey, we need to reconsider this"? Yes, we did. Yes, we um, we were advocating uh, very much for that stay. Um, we were partnered with uh, U of R um, Med and the county as well on this, and so we were together and independently uh, reaching up to the governor's office and the uh, um, highest levels of the Department of Health to let them know the same. Yes, it was hundreds of nurses. Yes. Yeah. Well, not just nurses, but yes, we had we had hundreds of employees that had not been boosted. So the mandate would have was putting a lot of um, um, pressure on, you know, what, what we would do and how we would handle it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, on the vaccine, that reminded me. Um, during, I think at the beginning of the Omicron, uh, you and uh, others uh, came out strongly urging 
uh, not staff and patients to get vaccinated and indicated that uh, uh, at the height of the pandemic, uh, unvaccinated people were uh, accounting for virtually all the ICU uh, and many of the uh, hospital beds. Um, it is, uh, uh, is, is that still, would you still urge people who are unwilling but otherwise could be vaccinated to get vaccinated? Is that still a problem? Oh, I certainly would, Will. I, I strongly urge everyone to be vaccinated. It, it is such a amazing technology to live in a day and age where vaccinations are available to us. And you, you may find it interesting to know that the, the, the science of vaccination began to develop in, um, in, the, in the late uh, mid 1700s. Um, and this was observed between individuals who became ill with a disease called cowpox and those who became ill with a disease called smallpox. And um, cowpox offered some immunity to, uh, cowpox which was relatively mild, offered some immunity to an otherwise very severe smallpox. And so doctors at that time were actually inoculating patients with, um, with smallpox and cowpox to test these ideas. So it's been around for a long, long time. And, you know, and I think it's well known that smallpox is one of the, probably the only disease completely eradicated from the human population because of vaccination. And so vac vaccines are uh, an amazing um, gift of technology and they do continue to evolve. And there are many, many vaccines available now that can greatly reduce human suffering. And I just wholeheartedly support um, vaccinations of all kinds and encourage our population to, to, um, to accept them and to follow through with them. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mayo, for taking the time. Um, enjoy your Friday and your weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.